you to these gentlemen, two of my favorite musicians. It's Sam Yehel on the piano. Massimo Pilocati. 
Matthew on the bass. So, um, maybe some of you guys recognize that tune. It's sort of a jazz standard, I guess, kind of a more obscure jazz standard called I Wish I Knew. Uh, we're going to play one of my original tunes now. This is called Passaic.
right, so I guess we should, uh, we should talk a little bit. Um, they, got, they got the lights dialed in here and everything. Um, Lori already told you guys about me, um, but I want to tell you about these gentlemen because there's some musicians that you should seriously check out if you haven't already. Um, I first became aware of Sam's playing a while ago. He did some CDs for a label that's called Criss Cross. And um, I knew him first as an organ player, like Hammond B3 organ. And um, he did a bunch of those CDs. And he also has one that I really like that's called Truth and Beauty. It has Brian Blade and Joshua Redman. And there's another one that's called Yeah, Yeah, Three. Um, and then recently, I started hearing more of his work playing piano, which I guess he, he started on piano, right? Actually, you know, I should just let him tell you, but um, he's a really amazing pianist, and um, I heard him at the Vanguard a few times, and I heard a few recent records that he did on piano, and I was just blown away. So I'll have Sam talk a little bit about his, uh, I guess, musical background or something. Or if, if you guys have questions for us, you just hop in whenever. What inspires you to write that music? You wrote that music. What inspires you to write that, write that music? Um, do I need this mic? Okay, right, I'll use it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I mean, Okay, I guess a lot of the tunes, that particular one sort of has a particular inspiration, I guess, because there's this river near where I live in New Jersey that's called the Passaic River. And um, the vibe with that river is, it's like curving all around. It's like a, it's like a snake or something. Um, so I was kind of thinking of that, and I was also thinking of like a certain uh, very dark quality because it's like, it's one of these, it's got to be one of the most polluted rivers in America, you know. New Jersey, there's just like dumping all this stuff in there all the time. But it's still, it, it's, it, in a way, it kind of has like this uh, redeeming beauty in it too. So I was kind of trying to get that in there too. It's kind of like this dark beauty of this river that's curving all around. So um, I was trying to accomplish that like through different meters. Like you could hear that main vamp was like one measure of 6-4 and then three measures of 5-4 and then also through like a predominantly minor tonality with the tune but opening up and trying to go to some uh, other more happy places that captured some of that beauty of the river too. So long answer but hopefully that Thank you. <laughs> That's the answer. Uh, I'm going to talk without a mic. The formal training is... is um, I studied some piano when I was seven or seven or so, and then I quit when I was 12. Uh, and then I got serious about it when I was about 17. I started getting into jazz. So I had no classical training. When I went to, uh, and then I decided to try to go to music school. I didn't think I have a, I didn't know if I have, was realistic or not. So I, I could kind of play some piano. I could definitely get around the instrument a little bit, but I didn't have any formal training, couldn't read, didn't know how to play jazz. And I went to college at, uh, at the new school in New York. And um, I failed all my classes. <laughs> but there were a lot of great musicians going to school at that time. Uh, and I hung out with them, and I learned how to play uh, from them. And I did a lot of playing in the new school while I was in the new school. So basically, I was in the new school for over, you know, something like four and a half years. And during that time, I really started to get a grip on what it would mean to play, to learn how to play jazz. So when I graduated from college, I felt like, now I know what I need to do in order to learn how to play jazz. There was somebody who came, gave a guest lecture at our school. I think it was Dave Liebman or something like that. He said, it takes 10 years to learn 
how to play uh, play jazz. And I mean, I'm 40 now, and I would expand that and say it takes 10 years to learn how to do anything. So uh, when I got out of college, I felt like I was kind of on my way, but definitely not not close. And then um, I started studying classical piano at that point. So I was 24, 25. I was studying jazz, and I kept on saying to myself, you know, I wish I wish I had this classical training that all these great guys have, and I, you know, it's too late for me, da da da. And one time I was having a conversation with my piano tuner, and I said, yeah, I wish I would have had this classical training like all these other prodigies. And he said, listen, just go. I know a great teacher. Just get it now. What's the difference? So I started studying classical music at the age of 25. I uh, started learning how to play the piano a little better. And from then on, it's just been a continuous study. Like I, when you say, what's your formal training? And it kind of has this implication that, that the training is over. But the older I get, the deeper I get into the training. The less I feel like I know. And everybody has their own path. But for me, I love, I really cherish a good one-on-one -on -one teaching relationship. So... I'm always seeking out teachers. Right now I have a new classical teacher that I'm studying with. I have a, another teacher that I'm studying other stuff with. And uh, so my training continues. That's pretty much uh, my story. Yeah, I have a pretty similar story. Uh, I learned to read music when I was very young, maybe 11 or 10. But then I got out of music and I started uh, playing again when I was 16, 17, first rock guitar, and then I got into jazz and got this big old instrument. And um, yeah. And then uh, I went to college first in Sweden, and then um, at age 24, I went to Boston, Berklee College of Music. So again, pretty late, but you know, I had some knowledge already, and I was lucky to be able to play with a lot of great musicians. That was, that's the most that I got out of college was learn how to um, be independent in studying. Like he was saying, like, uh, it's, it's up to you to, to become a musician. You can go to a school and everything and, and, and have great teachers, but it's, I learned that I had to do all the work really, so. Being in school was a great excuse to spend 24 hours with music, uh, studying, playing with a lot of different people. So I went to college there in, in Boston, and then I got into the Monk Institute. So I went to LA, and that was even better because there was nothing else to do in LA other than going to the beach and practice. There were no musicians, not that many jazz musicians around, so a lot of practicing there again. And, and it continues, you know, it never ends. So formal training, it's in, you know, in college, you learn to to study, basically, and that's that's all you that becomes part of your growth. You know, it keeps going like that. Are you from Sweden? Yes, half Italian, half Swedish. Ah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> my mother's from Sweden. Ah, there you go. Yeah. The blonde hair. Checking out recordings and transcribing and stuff like that. 
I'd say when I was in college. But there's a really great, for those of you who are drummers, I know there's a lot of amazing drummers who teach here, but um, I had a great teacher in the Twin Cities named Phil Hay, uh, some of you may know. He showed me a lot of stuff. Uh, and then I went to USC, University of Southern California, which is where I met Massimo. Yeah. Okay. Um, and for me, going there, I, I really, I mean, not that I have a lot of stuff together now, but going there, I really didn't have a lot of stuff together. And it was just kind of like, just jump in. And I, I didn't know any tunes or anything like that. But there, you know, there were a lot of really good musicians there. And uh, you know, we would just play. And, and then after playing, I, I try to like record it sometimes. Or just, you know, make notes on where I need to improve, like learn those tunes, and it's just sort of, like they were saying, kind of sets up those habits of, uh, you know, just being like a functional musician, practicing, getting better, <coughs> maybe writing music. Um, yeah, so that I'd say college is cool, but when you, that's, that's really only kind of just setting up good patterns for you. I wanted to know how you started playing organ and what you like about the organ, what situations you like to use it in versus when you like to play the piano. Uh, I started playing the organ when a friend of mine, uh, Larry Goldings, he had a gig at the Blue Note. This was like right when he started playing the organ too. And uh, I was hanging out with him at school one day. He said, listen, I'm going to... Uh, pick out the organ to be delivered to my gig tonight. We've got to go to this rental company in New York called SIR. Do you want to come with me? Sure. You know, what, you know I'm going to pick out a B3. What's a B3? You know? And uh, I just remember we walked into this warehouse and uh, the guys were like, oh, we, got, we set, set up three organs for you. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen a Hammond B3 up close, but it's, you know, we walked in the room and the, one of them was already on and there was just like this hum. And then all of this beautiful wood. And it just, it was amazing. And then he sat down and played it. And all this sound came out of to Leslie's speaker. And that was it. I mean, I was like, I'm, I'm playing this instrument, you know. There was no, you know, I was just like, I must, must play this instrument. It was, it was really like a, a calling, you know. And... Um, after that, uh, I said to I said to Larry, "Man, I want to play this instrument." He's, you know, and he had a portable organ that he used to use on gigs. And uh, at the time, there weren't very many of those portable organs. Now there's a lot of them, but there were very few that sounded any anything decent. And there was one called the Korg BX3. And uh, I said to him, "I'm gonna I should get one of those Korg BX3s, and then I can start messing around." He said, "Yeah, that's a good idea." And then. Three weeks later, he called me up. He said, hey, I just saw there's an ad for a Korg VX3. Really? Yeah, we should go check it out. So I bought it. And uh, as soon as I bought it, it was like, let's play sessions. And it was constantly playing sessions. And I mean, I sucked. You know, I was terrible. I had no idea how to do it. And, but it was so much fun to just even try. And uh, we were in college, and we would just, you know, I would just lug it into a into one of the rehearsal rooms and set up some drums. One thing I liked about the organ, and you mentioned organ versus bass player. The one thing I liked about the organ right away is it, it allowed me to connect with the drummer in a way that only the bass player gets to connect with the drummer. I think that's a very special relationship. If you get a chance to, to feel that, then it's, it's something you know really nice. So, I was really into that relationship with, with the drummers, and I also found that as soon as me and a drummer started playing, anybody else could come and go. We would have horn players coming through the room, playing solos, leaving, guitar players. I, it didn't really matter. We were just, we were playing, and that's kind of how I learned how to play. And eventually, uh, I started doing more gigs on organ because it was a rare commodity. You could basically take this portable organ and a drum set to any, any club, any cafe. I mean, we were playing at Starbucks. We were playing at, you know, it didn't matter. We didn't need anything, just an outlet, basically. Whereas if you have a piano, you know, you need 
X, Y, and Z. So because of that, I started playing a lot of gigs on organ, which led to more gigs on organ, and then started recording a little bit on organ, which led to more recordings on organ. So the piano took a back seat. Now flash forward 15 years later, you know, you play the organ, you get, a, you get this special connection with the drummer, you also give up something, you know. You give up the ability to, to wait, let something else happen, to have the choice whether you can play or leave space to listen to the overtones of the piano, which the organ does not have in the same way. I mean, the organ has overtones, but it's completely different. Uh, the sound of the piano. I, I feel much, uh, much freer on the piano. So I love both instruments, but those are basically the choices I'm looking at. You know, do I want a stronger connection with the drummer? Do I want a stronger rhythmic sense of gro being grounded? Um, or do I want a, a more of a kind of a floating, a free chance to interact and leave space and all? And, and that's how I kind of look at those, those two instruments. Uh, question, what, after you got your education, what kind of things did you do career-wise or move to the community to put yourself in a position of being a band leader now in the career that's not the career of a band? Well, <coughs> I mean, still, I'd say 90 or 95 percent of everything I do is sideman, you know? But um, I guess I, I didn't really think of it in terms of like moves or something like that. But um, I just, I kind of developed an interest in, in composing like maybe my junior or senior year in college. I really didn't write anything before then. And the stuff I wrote then was like really bad, but it, it, it kind of it got me into at least writing, you know. And then, you know, since I was writing these tunes, I'd want to like, you know, go play them somewhere other than just my studio at home. So I try to set up like, you know, little gigs for the group. I was still, I lived in Los Angeles for three years after I graduated from USC. So, you know, I was still just doing gigs, you know. Um, I played a lot with this vocalist, I was touring with her. And, um, but then I, I moved to New York, like, three years after I graduated, about four years ago now. And then I kind of, it made me want to get more into, you know, doing my, some of my own music there in addition to playing other people's music. So um, it kind of motivated me to record. And I think once uh, we recorded, then it's like, okay, well, we should try and, you know, get some gigs to play this music. And... Um, and then we did that. That was, I guess, a year and a half ago or two years ago. But then by that point, I had all this other new music that I wanted to record. And um, so we, uh, and it was really hard. So we got this gig, like kind of this, it was a weird gig. It's like late at night, but it's cool because you can play for a week long, you know. And we got that to kind of like play, sort of like rehearsal gig, you know, to, to play the music for a week before we recorded. And then, um, you know, right now we're just sort of traveling in support of that, playing some of that music. We're also going to do, at the Artist Quarter tonight and tomorrow, we're also going to do some of Sam's tunes and stuff and standards. But I don't know. In terms of setting the stuff up or, or booking those things, I, I don't really do that myself. My girlfriend helps me out, and she's super amazing. You know, I don't have a... A booking agent or anything like that per se, but she just um, kind of has a sense for doing that stuff because, it, you know, I, I don't really have the chops to like say to a club owner like, yeah, book book my group. This is like the baddest stuff you'll ever hear or something. But she she was able to set up mostly like this tour that we're doing. Hey, we have about six seven minutes left. Probably not for another two. Yeah? Oh, yeah. If you, if you guys have more questions, don't forget 115. They're going to be taken out doing a clinic. And then you can really ask them some great stuff. Very fun. Where'd you go to school in Sweden? Uh, in Stockholm. Oh, I love Stockholm. I have some people there, but my family's from Grooms and Carlsbad. 
out west. Right. See, now my accent comes, because I took my mother there, you know, that Carl said, yeah. Very cool. So great to have you guys. <coughs> Sam, excellent. Dr. Moe and Matt. One more song coming up, but let's give a big hand to Matt. So I was suggesting that we do a ballad, but Massimo thought that might be a little bit mellow way to end it. So <laughs> we're going to play um, another composition of mine that's on this, uh, this new CD. Um, this is uh, Pete's Place. <laughs> 